folks and welcome to the Hillbilly Kitchen. Today we're going to be making hardtack, which is the ultimate prepper and survival food. Basic hardtack is three cups of flour, two teaspoons of salt, and a cup of water. This is probably one of the oldest recipes in the world. It's very, very similar to matzah, which is the unleavened bread that the Israelites took with them when they left Egypt. Matzah usually does have some olive oil in it. You don't put oil in this because you're going to store it and fat will cause stored food to go bad. Um, you can make this for long-term storage and seal it up in mylar with oxygen absorbers. You can vacuum seal it with um, a food saver or some other vacuum sealing machine and you can put oxygen absorbers in that or leave them out if you vacuumed it but you want to put it in an airtight container. If you're not going to store it for long periods of time, if you want to make it to take backpacking or camping or hunting to add it to stew, just put it in a Ziploc freezer bag and seal it up good and tight because you do want to protect it from air. Now to make this, like I said, just three cups of flour, two teaspoons of salt. You don't want to leave the salt out of this for several reasons. One of those is that salt is a preservative. Um, the other one is that if you're using it in some sort of a survival situation, you're gonna need that salt. Now, it's gonna be tempting when you add this water and you start mixing this to add more water. Don't add more water because it will take forever for it to get done and a, a cup will make this dough stick together. Okay, all we're going to do is pour our cup of water in with our three cups of flour and our salt. You can mix this a little bit with a spoon, but you're going to end up having to just squeeze it with your hands. You kind of need it, but um, I'm not sure kneading is the right word for this dough. You can see there that is very dry. Um, all the flour is not even really good and moist. You want to cook it until it's dry and it's done and as soon as it cools then you want to seal it up. Now see what I mean here? This is very dry. I still have a lot of powder and I'm just going to kind of start squeezing it to get it together. I did put down a little wax paper just to keep it from making a mess. This was um, a staple during the Civil War. Um, Civil War soldiers for both the Union and the Confederate Army ate this. And there are stories about how it would get bugs in it and when they would put it in their coffee to soften it up so that they could eat it they would skim the bugs off of the top of it. That does not sound very appetizing to me. But if you keep it sealed up airtight, this will last literally indefinitely. And if you prepare it right, um, you want to make sure your hands are clean whenever you touch it, when you're working with the dough, when you take it out of the oven to turn it over at the halfway point and when you take it out to seal it up. Because if there's anything on your hands that gets in your hardtack, it can cause it to go bad. Now that wasn't too bad. We've got it all stuck together there. Most of the crumbles are in it. That was actually probably the easiest batch I've mixed up since I started making this. Now the next step is you want to get this to the point where it is a little thinner than a half an inch. Um, you want to do that for a couple reasons because you want it to dry out really good. If it doesn't get dry it won't um, preserve well and also, if it's thicker than half an inch, you're never going to get it softened back up when you start to eat it. Now, like I said, this is good if you want to take it backpacking or camping or hunting. You can add it into soups or stews to make it 
a heartier meal, give it a few extra calories. Um, it has to have holes in it poked one inch apart. And that serves two purposes as well. It makes it dry out quicker so that you can get it cooked quicker. But also, it helps it absorb liquid when you get ready to eat it so that you can eat it. Um, once this is cooked, you can put it in your mouth and suck on it a little bit to eat it. Um, it but it, it's called hardtack for a reason. It is quite hard. Um, it's not overly tasty by itself. If you were making it to take backpacking or hunting or camping or something like that, you can add some seasoning in it, which will give your soup or your stew a little extra seasoning. But if you're making it to um, store for long-term storage, you don't want to do that. You just want the flour and the salt and the water. And I would use unbleached flour for this. It is all-purpose flour. You don't want any kind of leavening in it. You don't want this to rise up. I made this thing here that looks like a torture device. Um, it has 16 nails in it. They're about an inch apart. They're just through a piece of cardboard and then I covered it with electrical tape to keep it from getting dough all over it and falling apart. And Melinda came over and she looked at it and she said, oh, what you need is a dough docker. I said, a what? She said, a dough docker. We use them for pizza crust. So every teenager who has ever worked in a pizza joint knows how to poke holes one inch apart in dough. So survivalists, you can get a dough docker. It's a very cheap little inexpensive tool. Or you can sit around and make this. I'll show you how they both work. I mean, if you want to make something like this, like I said, it's not too hard. You just measure it out and poke your nails through um, a piece of cardboard. But it basically works like this. It does give you nice straight lines so that you can uh, cut this in even pieces. Because we're going to cut it in three to four inch pieces. This also gives you pretty straight lines. It kind of sticks in the dough. It makes bigger holes though, which I think might be better. And it's certainly faster. As you can see, much bigger holes, much faster. So if you're going to make a lot of this and store it, get a dough docker. In fact, I'm going to go over my little holes with this. Okay. To cut it, I did decide when I first started making it to use my pizza cutter. And like I said, you want to cut it in about three to four inch pieces. A batch is only going to make about nine pieces. And you're going to be tempted to mix up a whole five pound bag of flour at one time. Well, you would never get it mixed up. Now you can cook several batches at once but you don't want to mix several batches at once. So go ahead and break it down into the three cup measurements to mix it because you'll never get it mixed. But once you cut it, well, that's so sticky it stuck to my paper a little bit. You're just going to place it on a cookie sheet. You don't have to have the parchment paper. I kind of thought the paper might help it dry out a little bit quicker. And you don't have to have the wax paper on the countertop either, but if you've ever scraped dough off your countertop, you know you want wax paper or something down while you're working with it. You want to preheat your oven to 250. You're going to cook this really slow for a really long time. We're going to leave it in the oven without touching it for about two hours. Then we're going to pull it out, flip it over, put it back in the oven for another two hours, and then we're going to check on it. And at that four hour mark, it should be done. 
I'm suspecting this batch here is gonna take a little bit longer because it's a little stickier. And I'm not quite sure why. It could just be that there's more humidity in the house right now. Now, when I was moving that batch from the counter to the pan, some of my holes kind of look like they closed up. So I'm gonna hit them with this thing again. You'd have to have the holes in it. It won't dry out and it won't um, absorb moisture when you get ready to eat it. And the rest of those look all right. Now you do wanna preheat your oven. 250. If you don't preheat the oven, the heat from the bottom of the oven is going to dry the bottom out a little bit more than what you want. And it's possible that it could burn um, before it gets done. You're going to leave it in here four hours and you don't want it to burn. So once your oven's preheated, put it in the oven. I've had several comments where people ask me about what I think about current events and how they relate to end times prophecy. Uh, I don't have any particular insight into end times prophecy. I do study it a little bit. Um, I read about it in the Bible, of course. Um, and I listen to what a lot of other people have to say. Personally, I hope, I pray that current events are leading toward a revival in this country and um, a restoration into God's favor. And that this is just the start of many, many more years where our country is a God-fearing nation, a Christian country, and we're blessed by God. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But um, what I do know is that you can read in the Bible exactly how Jesus said the end times were going to happen exactly what Jesus said about his coming and you can read that in Matthew chapter 24 Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21 um, he his disciples came to him he was sitting on the Mount of Olives and in those chapters Jesus refers to other books in the Bible and you can read those and really research it for yourself but what strikes me most about those is he talks about the deception that's going to occur and that so many of us are going to be deceived. Um, we're going to grow weary and lose our faith. Um, false prophets are going to come and they're going to try and lead people to um, people who actually claim to be Christ. Jesus said uh, they're going to come and they're going to say, I am Christ. So we need to know exactly what to look for when Jesus comes again um, and exactly how it's going to happen because he tells us. Uh, I do think there's a really big deception going on now or a false teaching and I don't think it's deliberate. I think um, that the people who are teaching it are teaching it with the best intentions. But I want to encourage you to read these verses for yourself and see what Jesus says about it. Because um, if you don't follow the Bible and you only follow a teacher, you're setting yourself up to be deceived. And the Bible warns against that. We are not supposed to follow a teacher. We're supposed to follow Christ. We're supposed to follow God's Word. And we need to study that for ourselves. So. Um, whatever your uh, opinion about the rapture is or your theory on the rapture, make sure that's formed through study in the Bible. And make sure that you know what Jesus said so you know what to look for so that you're not one of those people that Jesus said was going to be deceived. Um, I'm not going to read these chapters to you because I think Jesus' words are far more powerful than mine. And um, I think that his ability to reach people is certainly greater than mine. I do want to refer you to those. Um, they're very plain. Uh, there's not a lot of parable in that or symbolism in that. Um, Jesus tells us, like I said, in plain words exactly how it's going to happen. 
So read those so that you know what to look for. And at the very least, I think we are headed into a great time of plenty. Now, whether this is the time of plenty that's gonna lead up to the great tribulation, I couldn't tell you because like I said, I don't have any great insight into that. And Jesus said, nobody knows that except for God, not even him. So I'm not gonna try to predict that. I hope it's years and years and years off in the future, but it may not be. Whether it is or not, I can promise you this, you are going to see tribulation. We all are. And that's something else that Jesus said in those chapters. He said that we're gonna see tribulation and that stuff is gonna come. Don't worry about that. It's always happened and it's always gonna happen. And several places in the Bible, God tells us that when we are in a time of plenty, we are supposed to store. That's a Christian thing to do. Um, if you look at the story of Joseph, he was warned of a famine and because he was warned of the famine, during that seven years of plenty, Egypt put back enough to sustain not only Egypt, but all the countries around Egypt. Um, the Bible tells us that a wise man fills his storehouse in a time of plenty so that he can prosper during um, times when there's nothing, during tribulations. I, like I said, it's all through the Bible. I really like Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, it, the parable of the ant, it starts out in verse 6. It says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Now surely to goodness we can be as wise as an ant. It talks about, it goes on and it talks about um, the dangers of being lazy and not putting back. But the size of your head and the size of an ant's head, we can be wise enough to put back in times of plenty. Um, and that's something we should all be doing. That's something that's kind of a way of life, or it used to be a way of life. I know my mom and my grandma and all my aunts, they would spend all spring, summer, and fall putting back. Um, they would start with the very first berries in spring and start picking and putting stuff back and planting gardens so that they could have enough in the fall to harvest and put plenty back. I mean, everything was started as soon as spring started and that went on all through the fall. And the last thing that was actually harvested was meat and that would be harvested in the fall and then put back, uh, cured even through the winter. So we should all be filling our storehouses now because we are certainly in a time of plenty. Okay, there are some essential instructions when you are preparing your heart tack. The first one is you want to make sure you are very clean. Anytime you touch it, you want to make sure your hands are clean because if there's bacteria on your hands and you touch it once it's cooked especially, then that bacteria is going to get on your heart tack and it's going to be sealed up in your final product and it's going to cause problems in it. The second thing is you want to make sure you cook it really done. Now that's going to take between four and six hours. But when it is done, if you push on it, it should not give any more than if you're pushing on your countertop. It is hard tack. It's going to be very, very hard. Um, we're going to check on ours here in just a minute. You're going to cook it two hours, check on it at the two hour mark, turn it over, cook it two more hours, check on it then. And if it's not done after four hours, then you're going to flip it over and check it about every 30 minutes and flip it until it gets done. And it could take, like I said, up to six hours. I've never had any take longer than six hours, but if it takes longer, cook it longer. You wanna make sure it's dry. Any moisture in it will cause it to decay and it will go bad and then it won't be there when you need it. The second thing is how you store it. You wanna store it in airtight containers. And I've just got mine in food saver bags. You can put it in mylar and seal it up with oxygen absorbers, um, but you wanna protect it from moisture and from light. You, so if you store it in these, you wanna put it in the cabinet, put it in some of those food buckets or something like that. 
and you have to keep it airtight to keep that humidity out because the humidity will cause it to start to disintegrate. And part of that is storing it as soon as it's cold. Um, as soon as this cools down, you want to get it sealed up in bags. Don't leave it sitting for days to finish hardening. I've heard people give that advice or read that advice, you know, just cook it and then let it sit. It'll get hard. What it'll do is it will attract moisture and it will attract bacteria and all kinds of little microbes. You don't want to do that. As soon as it's cool, seal it up and put it away. And it, that will give it a 25 year plus shelf life. Theoretically, it'll last for forever. It'll certainly be there when you need it, whether it's during uh, a natural disaster or, heaven forbid, if it's during the Great Tribulation. But whenever you need it, it will be there and it will be edible if you handle it correctly, prepare it correctly, and seal it correctly. In two hours, you're going to come back to the oven and you're going to pull out your hardtack. In two hours it's going to look like this and all these holes were poked with my little nail thing here you can see they're not very big you're going to turn it over and you can see the bottom side is a little more yellow than the top side it's already starting to dry out after two hours but it's still soft i can still push it with my finger and you don't want to be able to push it with your finger you don't want it at all doughy when you take it out of the oven so just flip all the pieces over and then put it back in the oven for another two hours. Okay, at the four hour mark, we're gonna go back to our oven and we're gonna check on our hard pack. Okay, these pieces, of course, have already been turned over, and you can see the yellow on the bottom, or brown, or whatever color you want to call it. The top does not really brown like that. And it is very hard now. I cannot poke it at all with my finger, so that tells me that it's dry. I have no give at all in it, and that's what you want. If you've got give, put it back in there, let it dry out some more. Now, you do want to let this completely cool, but like I said, you don't want to leave it sitting out or sitting in your oven for two or three days because it will absorb, absorb moisture out of the air, and it will start to get soft again. And even if it doesn't start to get soft on the outside, it's going to be soft on the inside. And not only that, being exposed to air for two or three days, it's going to attract microscopic organisms that are going to cause it to decay. It's going to get bacteria on it. It's going to get mold on it. And like I said, you want to make sure you wash your hands before you touch it because if you have anything on your hands while you're checking it and then it gets on your bread, it's going to make it mold. These are very hard, and as soon as they cool down, I'm going to seal them up, and they will last forever unless they get wet. There are still existing pieces of hardtack from the American Civil War that could be eaten if you're brave enough. <laughs> but if you make this and you store it for emergencies, it's okay to drag it out like when you're snowed in in the winter and you want to make a pot of stew and maybe you want some dumplings or something in it, you can throw some of this in it and you will get that kind of a dumpling texture once it has cooked and absorbed water again. Um, you know, if you're out of bread and you're snowed in and you want something with some bread in it, this would work great. I said it's good to take backpacking, hunting, camping and throw it in stuff or just put it back and keep it in case the absolute worst happens. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Before you leave, don't forget to click like and subscribe so that you get notifications every time we put up a new video. And until next time, 
don't forget to put God first. Thanks for joining us in the Hillbilly Kitchen. We'll see y'all again soon.